Um, so moving on to what I'm going to talk to you about. So um, I'm an immunologist, um, but I actually am interested in the interactions of immunity with different pathological conditions. Um, I think it's always worth taking questions a step back and, 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 and seeing them in context. And we're, we're looking at the immune system. So the question is, you know, what does the immune system do? And usually most people will answer that the immune system is there to defend us from pathogens. Um, but actually, if you go back to the origin of immunology as a science, um, so this guy, Ilya Mechnikov, who was Russian and died in, in France, he's actually, I think, he's buried in the Pasteur Institute. Uh, but he actually did his research in Italy. So he thought he was the person who identified macrophages and neutrophils. Um, and he thought of immunity as something which doesn't just defend the self, but also defines the self. And the idea of definition of the self may be, um, may sound a bit weird, but if you look at these, um, actually, I shouldn't use this because you probably can't see it online. Maybe I can use uh, this, okay. Um, so if you, See on the left, we have a parasite, so that's a pathogen. Um, and there we need to defend ourselves from the pathogen. But on, on the right, we have an allograft versus an autograft. So our own skin transplanted onto ourselves or someone else's skin. And if it's someone else's skin, um, within a few days, it gets rejected because the immune system recognizes this as something foreign. So this is not an issue of defense. You know, we're not going to be attacked by a transplant but it's defined, it's, it's identified as not us, not self. So clearly um, the immune system is involved in this um, self, non-self um, distinction and the, therefore the definition of what is the self. And, and I'm gonna show you actually something kind of uh, strange here. So this is an aquatic animal called the Botrylus so it looks a little bit like a sponge. It's not a sponge. If you call it a sponge, people might be offended, I guess. But it's a multicellular organism that forms clones, colonies of clones. All the yellow ones uh, that you see here are cousins, uh, are, are twins, whereas the brown versus the yellow are cousins, right? So it just, it's a colony forming very simple animal. It just sits on a rock and filter feeds. Very boring lifestyle. It, the only choice in life is is my neighbor myself because they're twins or is my neighbor my cousin okay and if my neighbor is my cousin i kill them and take over their territory basically so i can filter feed more um, and this is done through a mechanism which involves something that looks a lot like allo recognition so what this says is that the 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 aspect of immunity that has to do with the definition of the self is actually very old it's not just since we've been doing transplants that this question has been around this this predates um, vertebrates so it is a worthwhile question um, thinking about and where it comes into play um, is, is, is in a question that is highly linked to our existence on this planet um, so I have here six images of animals I know we have an audience of uh, four here but there's also people online um, so do you know what the first five have in common Anyone? The first five. They have eggs, right? So the first five have eggs, humans don't. So the egg is a really, really important concept because the father and the mother are genetically different. They're different selves. The adaptive immunity of the mother will recognize the father if they were in contact. If you have an egg, you don't have this problem. But the egg poses an issue, it poses a problem because it limits the amount of food you can give to the embryo. If you didn't have the egg, you could give a lot more food and the baby could grow a bigger brain, take over the planet, for example. So clear evolutionary advantage in losing the egg. But if you lose the egg, suddenly you have contact between the, the, the paternal antigens expressed in the fetus and, and the maternal immune system. So you should have a rejection. You don't have a rejection. And this is called the immunological paradox of pregnancy. And it's clearly important because the, the, so the reason why this is there is because it gives us an evolutionary advantage. But how is this immunological paradox dealt with? This is a question that people have been asking for a long time. And the first one to state a possible answer was Peter Medawar, who came up with a number of ideas, basically saying that the, the mother and the fetus are apart. And it turns out that this is not the case. Um, all of three of Medawar's postulates have since been disproven. There is immunological contact between the two. 
it turns out that the answer to the question of how do you resolve the maternal fetal um, tolerance question has to do with these cells called uh, immunoregulatory T cells. So they're part of adaptive immunity. They're the cells that stop responses. They can stop T cells and B cells and, and innate cells. And um, so during my PhD, I was in, in, in the lab of Alex Betts. I was involved in work where we showed that basically without these cells, you can't have maternal fetal tolerance. And it's a very, very simple experiment that is worth sort of going through. Um, if you take mice and you mate them, you have babies. And the, 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 the plot here you see shows the number of successful pregnancies out of every successful mating. So it doesn't always work, but half the, half the mated females will have babies. If you remove the regulatory T cells from the females, then you don't have babies. It's as simple as that. However, if the father is of the same strain as the mother, which in humans would be the equivalent of being an identical twin, right? Um, and obviously, you know, with mice, you can do this kind of experiments because you have congenic strains, which are essentially twins. If the father is of the same strain, so there are no alloantigens present, then you don't need regulatory tissues because you don't have any alloantigens present. Um, actually, that's not entirely true because you still have some male antigens. And, and David Baltimore's group has actually shown that if you do enough of these matings, you see that there are slightly more females than males that end up um, being born. But um, I guess the, the, the conclusion here is that regulatory T cells are, are necessary for maternal fetal tolerance and compatible data has been shown in humans um, where, they, where people found that um, if you look at the number of regulatory T cells in intentional versus spontaneous abortions, in spontaneous abortions, you have defects in regulatory T cells. So this was done quite a while ago, and it has since been confirmed through various studies in mice and in humans, um, using also tools which are far more precise than the ones we used 15 years ago. Um, I'm just going to mention a few of the corollaries, a, a few of the sort of side conclusions, because they're interesting for the discussion we're going to be talking about after that. So um, these responses are at least partially antigen-specific, and they recognize the alloantigen. So this is, not, this is not just about self antigens. Um, and an and interesting um, sort of observation we made is that actually there is a, in mice, periodic circulation of the movement of the regulatory T cells in and out of the uterus so that they are there when the female is fertile, therefore likely to need to use them. Um, and similar data exists, has been seen in humans, where obviously with a 28-day cycle as opposed to a four-day cycle, there's no need to move them in and out. You just make them expand and contract. Um, and perhaps from an evolutionary point of view, the most interesting discovery is that if you look at FOXP3, which is the gene, is the, sort of the master regulator gene that makes regulatory T cells suppressive, um, there's lots of domains, but the full set of domains only appears in the platypus. There's a sort of early basic version of T-Rex in fish, but the full, the full Monty only shows up in the platypus which is this animal here, which I showed you before. So this is really interesting because the platypus bears, is, it has, has eggs, but is also a mammal. So it doesn't have the problem of maternal fetal tolerance because it has the egg, but it acquired um, the ability to have these fully suppressive uh, FOXP3 cells. And that means that once you have a break for the adaptive immune system, then you can lose the egg with the obvious um, evolutionary advantages, such as you know, bigger brain taking over the planet and so on. So um, this is interesting because it allows us to make a number of speculations. So perhaps adaptive immunity did indeed evolve in response to selective pressure for defense. But with the evolution of mammals, we have selective pressure for something that enables maternal fetal tolerance. Um, and for the reasons I've just explained, this would be a substantial advantage. So it would be selected for. So maybe adaptive immunity therefore evolved to defend us and to define us in a context where we need to sort of temporarily extend this definition during mammalian pregnancy. Um, but if this is true, and of course this is speculative, um, then once the females sort of are out of the range of fertility, then there should not be any evolutionary drivers for adaptive immunity. The system would be running blindly, basically. Um, 
And this idea is not new. Um, it, it's called antagonistic pleiotropy. It's the idea that you have evolved a certain system of functions in response to selective pressure, but once you go out of the range of selection, there is no optimized function, and that could lead to a number of diseases, which unsurprisingly are also associated with inflammation. So these would be autoimmunity, cancer, and cardiovascular um, disease. And so what my lab has been focusing on is really taking this idea and seeing what conclusions we can get about what adaptive immunity does in these contexts, and then turning these conclusions into more realistic immunotherapies or immunodiagnostic solutions. So, um, of course, in modern life, this problem is a lot more substantial because in the last 150 years, because of sanitation, vaccines, antibiotics, we live a lot longer. So, you know, most of our lives nowadays is actually in the range of non-optimal adaptive immunity, if we take this speculation as, um, as valid. So let's sort of go in and out into these issues and, and see a number of stories that come out of them. So. If we look at autoimmunity, um, there is a very old observation, actually made first by Hench, who's the guy who discovered uh, cortisone, um, that uh, women with rheumatoid arthritis get, three out of four women with rheumatoid arthritis get cured temporarily during pregnancy, and then the disease comes back. And indeed, not only does it actually come back, but a lot of incidence points tend to be after birth and at menopause, and I'll get back to that in a second. So we wondered, this is still while I was in Cambridge with Alex Betts, whether this could be linked to this expansion of regulatory T cells, and we found that if you take mice and you get them pregnant, if, if, the, the, if you have already induced arthritis, the arthritis is dampened, as you can see here on the, so, so the bottom line is pregnant mice, and these are non-pregnant mice. So there's a dampening effect on the autoimmunity, so the severity of arthritis goes down during pregnancy, and this is not because of a general immunosuppression, because if you vaccinate these mice, they both respond fine, as you can see here with the response to influenza on the right. So, um, and by doing adoptive transfers, we managed to show that this was because of the expansion of regulatory T cells. So the, the regulatory T cells are sufficient to actually con confer this protective um, effect. So again, we, if we take this conclusion and we, we, we sort of you know, use it as a starting point for some speculations, so regulatory T cells change in order to accommodate placental pregnancy. Um, I didn't show you the data, but there is data showing that this is estrogen driven. So it kind of goes down after pregnancy and at menopause, and this is important. Um, so we could again speculate that maybe regulatory T cells evolved enabling, um, or as a result of the fact that they evolved, we can have placental pregnancy, maybe the fact that the sort of, you know, the textbook function of these cells to control autoimmunity maybe is just an added bonus, a side effect, a positive side effect of their existence. But then a maladaptive cost of that, a risk of that would be that in individuals where their number goes down, so in women after pregnancy, in women at menopause, because their number goes down, you would have a risk of incidence of autoimmunity and indeed, for very many autoimmune diseases, you have a massive bias where you have a lot more women than men having the disease, and the key incidence points are exactly these points where the T-regs go down. Um, the flip side of this for the more mathematically oriented among you is that, so if the T-regs go up and down in females and they're flat and low in males, the integral of suppression would be higher in females overall, right? irrespective of the fact that there are points where you would have higher incidence when these numbers go down. So the fact that females overall should be more immunosuppressed or, or protected against inflammation is testable. And we did actually do that together with Adriana Maggi, an endocrinologist in Milan. If you take females and you overectomize them, which removes the estrogen, which I was saying drives these changes in the regulatory T cells, they end up being more inflamed and they die sooner like males. So that's in support of this conjecture that regulatory T cells and their pregnancy related control may affect the um, events such as autoimmunity, but of course this could potentially be extended to things like postpartum cardiomyopathy as we'll see later. Um, could be an explanation for, for, for the timing and the dynamics and the incidence and the female to male bias of these um, diseases. 
So um, just as an aside, the phenomena we're describing are an adaptation of adaptive immunity to fit pregnancy. Um, if we take a theoretical scenario where we have a pregnant woman who gets infected, a pregnant female who gets infected by, let's say, bacterial inflammation in the genital urinary tract, the fact that you have these regulatory T cells pose a potential risk because you might have something called bystander tolerance. So you suppress anti antigens, responses against antigens that you shouldn't, and then the infection could grow and kill the mother and the baby. That's clearly a disadvantageous scenario. It would make a lot of sense if you could put a break on the regulatory T cells in that context, um, in which case you would lose maternal fetal tolerance, you would lose the baby, but the mother would survive and she could have another baby after that. It turns out that such a switch exists and methods of identified that if you give tall signals, so TLR signals that basically identify presence of bacteria to dendritic cells that sit next to regulatory T cells, the regulatory T cells switch off. And that would enable such a mechanism to work. Um, so it sounds very brutal, but I guess life is, nature is quite brutal at some point, but it would mean that the mother would survive, lose the baby, but would survive to have another um, to, to have another baby. So this is interesting because if adaptive immunity is adapted to defense and then dealing with pregnancy, it's probably not adapted to things that happen afterwards, such as cancers. And a cancer in terms of how the immune system interacts with it is probably not very different from a pregnancy in the sense that you have self antigens, you have some neo antigens. Um, and a lot of the current experimental strategies against tumors involve the idea of giving toll signals to wake up the immune system to lead to tumor rejection. So if we follow that logic and if we follow down this, this sort of evolutionary centric um, path of looking at what uh, adaptive immunity does, we would get to the conclusion that it would make sense, for example, to try and use tumor vaccines as therapy, not prevention, uh, not just prevention. Um, for tumors, because it would make evolutionary sense. Like we're, we're, we're taking what the adaptive immunity thinks it's doing and we're pushing it in a direction which is compatible with the selective pressure that adaptive immunity has faced to get to where it is at the moment. So um, with this, essentially, we've kind of gradually moved into talking about tumors. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about some of the consequences of this rationale. Um, with regards to, to, to what the adaptive immunity does in a tumor context. So this actually started with a project funded by IRC a few years ago, and in a more mundane kind of way, I guess, less philosophical perhaps, we, like many others, we were playing around with T cells used in adoptive cell therapy. The idea there is that you have immune cells that help the tumor grow and you have, T, you have immune cells, T cells that fight the tumor, right? So, T cell therapy is based on the idea you take these T cells, which are good for you, you expand them, you put them back, you put them back in, and that can um, help fight the tumor. There's a couple of problems with this approach. One is that the T cells um, might not make it to the tumor, so they might get dispersed, lost. The other problem is that some tumors, uh, um, not all of them, but uh, have these collagen structures that surround them, which can deter T cell access into tumor. They can also deter the access of pharmaceuticals, for example. Um, plus the same collagen structures can boost the tumor um, uh, aggressiveness and, and, and enhance the E10 transition and so on. So for various reasons, T cells that you use in T cell therapy will not always make it into the tumor. So we thought, can we improve this in some way? Um, and so the idea um, we came up with was that maybe we could improve their homing by giving them a homing address. So we had done this actually in a pregnancy context quite a while ago. If you identify what chemokines, which are this, you know, small um, cytokines that, that, that are used to direct cells within the body, if you find what the chemokine address is of, of wherever you want you to send your T cells, as long as your T cells are made to express a chemokine receptor matching that chemokine, you can take them where you want. So we did that in a um, tumor model where you have spontaneous metastasis and we asked, okay, what are the chemokines selectively expressed by the spontaneous metastasis? Um, and in this case, uh, the, the, the one that was the most um, differentially expressed was CCL2. So basically we took the cognate chemokine receptor, so the receptor that enables the cell to be recruited and retained 
to the source of CCL2. And so we added CCR2 to, CCR2 to the cytotoxic T cells that should be able to kill the tumor. And we, as a result, improved homing to these sites. And as a result of the improved homing, um, we could show that we could improve the kinetics of the killing of the tumor by the T cells. So what this means is that by improving T cell homing, we could quantitatively improve the efficacy of adoptive cell therapy. And so this was work done by Stefano Garret and Claudia Sardi, two former postdocs in the lab who are actually both happily working in industry. Um, but one of the most interesting conclusions or side conclusions we drew from that project, and the reason I'm mentioning it, is that we, it, it, it made us actually look at these collagen structures that, as I said, they're not in all tumors. You find them in lung, in pancreas, and in breast. And I mean, if, um, if you see them early enough, obviously it's good news because you can just take out the whole tumor. But if you don't spot them early enough, for the reasons I explained before, they really are bad news. And we wondered, okay, so who, who causes this fibrosis? Because an oncologist might say, well, the tumor makes the fibrosis. But maybe the immune system is involved. Um, and so maybe it's fibroblasts, and it probably is fibroblasts. Maybe it's macrophages, um, and it probably is partly, even though there are some papers showing uh, a reduced effect of macrophages on fibrosis. So as we study adaptive immunity, we said, does adaptive immunity have a maladapted role in generating this fibrosis? Could the T cells be responsible for this? So to answer this um, question, we went back to the original experiment that demonstrated the presence of immunosurveillance. So this is the Schreiber experiment from 2001. Mouse with and without T cells plus tumor. And happy to say that it actually works as, 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 as the book says. So without T cells, tumors grow more because T cells do mediate immunosurveillance, okay? However, if you take these tumors and you look at them, the tumors that have grown in the absence of T cells have half as much fibrosis around them. And actually, if you add extra T cells, the T cells can permeate tumors that have grown in the absence of T cells a lot more, which means that T cells favor fibrosis formation, which is so pro-inflammatory T cells. Um, and that is a relatively unexpected finding, which would mean that it would make sense to do antifibrotic treatments um, whilst doing T cell-based therapies, because otherwise some of the T cells that you're boosting or adding could actually make your life more difficult by creating this um, fibrosis. Does this mean that the pro-fibrotic type 2 cells um, are always pro-tumoral? Not necessarily, but that's another story I'll uh, tell you probably at another time, because there's not enough time to fit everything in otherwise. So let me shift slightly away from tumors, and we'll get back into tumors later by talking about consequences of the maladapted roles of adaptive immunity in the second biggest um, sort of mortality cause together with tumors, which is cardiovascular disease. So I guess there the question is essentially, do T cells contribute to heart failure? And all of the experiments I'm gonna talk about have been done in collaboration with Gianluigi Condorelli and his amazing group of cardiologists who are next door neighbors in Humanitas. So, um, most of the experiments we've done here are using a standard model of heart failure, which is called the transaortic constriction, pressure overload, basically that drives um, heart failure in mice. And one of the first experiments we did is we looked at the levels of inflammation. So what you have here is a plot on the x-axis. You have um, an index of IL-6 divided by IL-10, which incidentally, uh, I just read the other day, is actually a very good index to see severity in COVID, which may or may not be irrelevant. Um, so the more to the right, the higher the inflammation. And on the y-axis, we have data from uh, echocardiography, so ultrasound on the same mice, and we see heart dysfunction. So the further up, the less the heart works. So if you see, so the green dots are healthy mice, and the orange and the red are different stages of cardiac disease. And the more the cardiac disease progresses, the more the heart is inflamed, the less the heart works. So this is a sort of... Um, it's a correlation and it's proportional. What's really interesting is if you look at the dark green mice, which are here, so these are mice that run on a treadmill, and it turns out that their heart works better than healthy, which is a good advertisement for gyms, I guess, and they seem to have less inflammation than healthy, which to me was quite amazing because it means that healthy doesn't mean zero inflammation. You can get lower than um, healthy, which I guess, I guess is good, good uh, advertisement for doing exercise. 
So um, this gave us some encouragement that there is a correlation between inflammation and, and cardiac disease. And as we study T cells, we looked for T cells in the mouse, and we found them as early as two days after the induction of the pressure overload that, that leads to heart failure. Um, and then we obviously, you know, we are trying to save human patients. So we looked at biopsies of the two main categories of, of, of cardiac disease patients, so half path and half breath, reduced or preserved ejection fraction. And we found T cells in, in both categories, and they were proportional to the severity of the disease. So T cells are in the heart. And the question is, are they doing something? So to cut a long story short, as this stuff has been published about three years ago, um, we used a drug that is um, FDA approved. Actually, it's a generic drug as, a, as of last year, so it's very, it's very, very safe. It's been used in a context of autoimmunity, and it blocks T cells by blocking T cell stimulation. So it blocks the full activation of T cells. And um, if you block T cells, you basically block the progression of heart failure, even if you give it quite late. And and the key, and and oops. And this is, as I said, work, again, done mostly by Lisa Martini, a postdoc, for a postdoc who just recently moved on to San Rafaele, um, together with uh, the group of Gianluigi Condorelli. And uh, I was saying this is the key figure. Um, this is ultrasound of cardiac functionality. Even if you give it halfway through the usual range where we monitor the disease, you can still block progression of disease. So this is quite an efficient um, uh, effect. So. Um, this is interesting, as I promised, we're going to go back and forth between uh, heart disease and tumors. This is not only linked to heart failure, um, tumor immunotherapy, not the T cell uh, therapy that I talked before that is more experimental, but the, the standard tumor immunotherapy that we do these days is we give anti PD1 to people, and in one out of three, the tumor goes away, which is amazing. However, it turns out that about one in a hundred cases, the fact that we release the T cells, so the way anti-PD-1 works is it releases the break of the cytotoxic T cells that should be killing the tumor. Uh, in about one in 100 cases, you get these potentially lethal myocarditis. And this was the first one, of the first or the second paper that actually identified these. There have since been many, many more, and the percentage is about a one, one in 100. Um, and this is becoming quite an issue. So um, in this case, we have a T cell who, that is left to be allowed to be unleashed, to become more activated, and it targets the heart. According to what I've just showed you, this is not exactly surprising if normal heart disease is diesel mediated. And actually, we were very pleasantly surprised that the, um, the same group of clinicians that identified this um, tumor therapy-induced myocarditis actually last year used the same protocol as we used in the mice three years ago to treat people that were at risk of dying from lethal myocarditis. And the paper came out in New England Journal of Medicine, and basically they saved these people. What happens to the tool is another issue, and it has to be dealt with. But at least you know you get rid of the acute problem of your tumor patient, your oncological patient, dying from acute myocarditis. So um, T cells are involved, and they're necessary, because if you block them, you block the progression of disease. We next asked, okay, it cannot be just T cells because T cells generally don't work on their own. They work through macrophages, neutrophils, and, 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 and all the other cells of the immune system. So to answer this question, we took again the same model of um, uh, pressure overload heart failure, and we applied single cell sequencing, taking advantage of a machine that, that was uh, introduced in the lab. And we looked at early and late disease, and we looked at just the immune cells that infiltrate the heart. So again, the model is the same as before. So it's induced heart failure because of pressure overload. And we're looking just at the immune cells. And so there's a lot of data here, but I'm just going to um, sort of guide you to focus on just one simple detail. I don't know if you can see the mouse. So this is a list of the cell populations we find in the heart. And basically, we find just about every immune cell population known. And they're arranged according to abundance uh, with the colors of the rainbow. And if you see at the late stage disease, all the colors of the rainbow are mixed up, which means that different cell types expand differently in response to the disease, which means that in different ways, every cell type somehow interacts with disease. And that's a sort of very, on a very basic level, it tells you that, that all immune subsets are in some ways responding to the presence of disease. And so there are many stories there. I'm just going to highlight a few that I think are more interesting. Um, but obviously, the data is there, and people are now actually starting to take it apart according to the 
what they already know about the biology of all of these cell types. So there's been a lot of work on macrophages in the context of cardiac disease and people starting from uh, Ethelman uh, in 2014 have identified different subsets of macrophages, two of which are very pro-inflammatory and seem to be the ones really responsible for the actual disease. And we found that these two pro-inflammatory CCR2 bone marrow derived, um, as in bone originating from the bone marrow macrophages, um, tend to, uh, they, they were the biggest expressors of a cytokine called oncostatin M, and this was also confirmed at the protein level. The reason why this is interesting is that the idea that inflammation and cardiac disease are linked is not new, and people have even tried a, um, a number of clinical trials, the most famous of which was using anti-TNF, which is a very successful anti-inflammatory drug used in autoimmunity, to block heart failure. And famously, that trial failed, and when it failed, it led a lot of people to, to write off the idea that you can manipulate the immune system to cure heart disease. Now, what's really um, interesting is that um, studies have shown that if you look at colitis patients that get treated with anti-DNF, whose macrophages express on costatin, these patients tend to be refractive to anti-DNF. So if the macrophages in the heart express on costatin, then anti-DNF was never going to work. So the fact that the trial didn't work has nothing to do with the fact that inflammation is not linked to heart, heart disease. So um, I guess um, our hypothesis is restored. So there is a rational explanation why the, that, the, the, the trial didn't work. Um, moving on to another little story, uh, again, emanating from this uh, wealth of data that came with a si single cell sequencing, we identified a lot of B cells within the heart. So these are images of uh, uh, clar some, some clarified um, hearts, and you can see. So it's, I know it looks like uh, immunofluorescence, but it means you can see a lot more tissue actually, uh, because you, you make it transparent. We saw t B cells within the heart, and we were surprised to find a lot of CD86 within these uh, B cells. Again, this made. Um, made sense and, and led us to, to, to understand why the abatacept, the, 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 the T-cell co-stimulation blockade treatment worked, because the way the T-cell co-stimulation, the drug, the FDA-approved drug that I mentioned before works, is it's, it doesn't target T-cells directly, it stops antigen-presenting cells that could be macrophages, could be dendritic cells, could be B-cells, it, it stops them from co-stimulating the T-cells, which boosts the T-cell activation. Um, and so the drug blocks the co-stimulation receptors on the antigen-presenting cells, which blocks T-cell activation, which then eliminates the cardiotoxic effect. Um, we have shown that the effect was IL-10 dependent and that all the IL-10 and, and this dependence came from B cells, but we didn't really figure out, couldn't really figure out why B cells were critical to this equation. And if B cells are the ones that express CD86, which is the actual target of abatacept, then that explains why we have this B cell dependence in our effect. Um, third story, um, again, emanating from the same uh, single cell sequencing data, PD-1, which we've already mentioned in the context of uh, tumor immunotherapy, um, we found it in the heart, and it was really weird because we found its expression both at the RNA level and at the protein level in uh, populations of regulatory T cells and induced regulatory T cells. Um, actually, when we, the paper came out, I wasn't so certain that the second population was induced regulatory T cells. We have since analyzed it a bit more, and I'm quite confident that they really are induced regulatory T cells. Um, so what, the reason why this is interesting is, as I said, PD-1 is used in a concept in, 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 in tumor immunotherapy. You, you block anti-PD-1, therefore you release the T cell, the cytotoxic T cells, and they kill the tumor. But of course, when you give the drug systemically, it will affect T cells everywhere. Um, and as I said, in one out of 100 cases, this leads to myocarditis. So, you know, it begs the question, what does anti-PD-1 do to the heart? So to answer that, we actually did the experiment. We took mice that did not have cardiac problems. We gave them anti-PD-1. And what we got was we found T cells in the heart and we found the type 1 inflammation. So if you can see the cytokines, IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, interferon gamma, signifying type 1 responses, and we saw a clear um, reduction in heart functionality. And these are normal mice. They're not cardiopathic in any way, right? So in theory, this could happen to anyone who gets anti-PD-1. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky because the, the literature 
Um, as I said, we found PD-1 on Tregs and induced Tregs. The literature here on what PD-1 does on Tregs, because on normal T cells, if you block it, you release them. They, they're more aggressive. The literature on Tregs and induced Tregs is actually split, and there's a lot of papers from the same groups um, showing that actually in Tregs, um, it's actually, um, it has the opposite effect of ITregs. So ITregs need it, and Tregs do not need it. So the, the effect we're, we're seeing would probably be compatible with induced Tregs um, losing their ability to suppress. So the, the, the model that we can uh, sort of come up with that fits what we see um, is that you have anti-PD-1, you give it to T cells, they can fight the tumor, but of course you affect T cells which are elsewhere in the body. Um, you have Tregs and induced Tregs which keep these T cells at bay, including in the heart. Um, and when you give anti-PD-1, Within the heart, you have an effect on induced Tregs, which blocks their ability to suppress. And obviously, the fact that you have T cells all over, which may be able to target the heart, would also activate them and get them to go into the heart, even though we could not find any um, P1 expressing cells in the heart, T cells uh, in the heart. And that would potentially lead to cardiotoxicity. So this is a potential beginning of an explanation of how does this cardiotoxicity in anti-PD-1 therapy um, uh, come about. It, it's, there, there are still questions and we, we, we have to sort of um, deepen our understanding of this. There's a lot of groups working on this, so I think we will know in the next few years how this works. Just a couple of snippets of information that also came out of the, the single cell sequencing study. Um, we found mast cells, very, very few. Um, so they hadn't been found before because unless if you look at only immune cells, there are so few, you basically dilute them out with the other cells that we have there. Be, then the uh, cardiomyocytes or fibroblasts and so on. And the mast cells were very, very active. Um, so they were producing a lot of IL-6. And it's interesting because if you dig down uh, into the literature, you can find papers from uh, 20, 30 years ago showing that mast cells are important for cardiac disease. And I guess this is the molecular proof of the mechanism of, of, of that um, mediation. Um, we also found neutrophils, and there were two different subsets, and it is possible that one of them is pro-inflammatory, the other one is more pro-repair. There's not a lot of data. There's some really nice new data on myocardial infarction, not yet on, on pressure overload. Um, clearly, every single immune population is in the heart, and they're doing things. And the fact that we know a lot about these immune cell populations means that I think there's a lot of space for a lot of this knowledge to sort of be diluted, to, to sort of trickle down into cardioimmunology or immunocardiology and figure out solutions for cardiac disease, which is a pretty major burden on our health systems. So if you want to look at these stories and a few others, the paper came out um, last year. As I said, this was mostly the work of Elisa Martini posted from my lab and Paolo Kunde Franco, a bioinformatician in Manitas, and it was done together with uh, Gianluigi's uh, lab and his amazing cardiologists. Um, so this is not the end of what I have to say, but just as, as a sort of, as, as a, um, as a summary of what we've set up to now, what I've told you is that adaptive immunity was not selected by evolution to deal with things that happen after the end of the reproductive, uh, reproductively active age. So stressed hearts would be one of these. Um, adaptive immunity seems to be necessary for the progression of pressure overload heart failure. And just about every immune cell is involved in the pathogenesis of, of, of heart failure. Um, we also asked whether our findings could be extended to other kinds of heart disease. And we took a very, very simple model, which is basically you just take mice and you wait. Um, so an age-related um, heart failure model. So basically, if you take mice and you wait, they start developing heart problems. And you start seeing a systolic dysfunction. And later on, if you wait long enough, you start seeing diastolic dysfunction. Um, and so when we did an immunophenotyping of these mice, we found a sort of wave of inflammation um, both and, and both at the mRNA level in terms of uh, cell infiltration, um, it's it's not a completely increasing wave. It seems to reach saturation levels on some of the mediators. This is something we had seen also when we did the study on estrogen and aging. Um, and and so we thought, okay, if there's inflammation, then it is maybe possible to to block this. So we use the same co-stimulation uh, blockade CTLA4 IG abatacept. Uh, and we used it quite late, knowing that already in the induced heart failure model, um, we could give it late and it still worked. So we gave it at 15 months and kept it going until 22 months. And we saw that it could reduce both the 
the progression of the loss of both systolic and diastolic functions. So the difference is you can see this is uh, systolic and this is diastolic. Um, so it seems to work basically. Um, and the mechanism again, I mean, this is a drug has been around for a long time. We know how it works. It blocks T cells, so indeed we see fewer T cells in the heart. It blocks uh, cells of the innate immune system either by directly targeting them if they're expressing the CD86 or as a downstream effect of the loss of, of the suppression of the T cells. So there's fewer macrophages, monocytes, well, macrophages inside the heart, and there's less fibrosis, which is, again, same as in the cancer context, downstream effect of, um, uh, of the inhibition of T cell function. And just like with the pressure overload uh, model, the effect was dependent on the presence of um, IL-10. So um, this came out just a few weeks ago. Uh, again, collaboration with the amazing team of Gianluigi Condorelli. Again, the work of Elisa Martini, uh, who's now doing uh, T cell therapy in uh, San Rafael. And so, updating those conclusions I told you about before, um, adaptive immunity seems to be necessary not just for pressure overload heart failure, but also for age related heart failure. So, getting closer to the end, but I just want to do a side step. We're talking about cardiovascular disease. We shouldn't neglect the vascular side. Um, so atherosclerosis, in other words. So um, it's already known there's been a lot more work on the vascular side than on the cardiac side that um, adaptive immunity is involved in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. And just copying this so the scheme I showed you before when we did targeted T cell therapy in tumors because we wanted to get more of the good T cells CD8 cytotoxic T cells into the tumors to fight the tumor rather than the, the immune cells that help um, the tumor grow, we basically flip the logic around. And given that uh, regulatory T cells have been shown already that they can suppress the uh, progression of atherosclerosis and, and, and plaque formation, we thought, OK, why don't we make sure that they go where the plaque is um, and help these T regs by modifying their chemokine receptors and do cell therapy with mo chemokine receptor modified so that they can go to the plaque and suppress the plaque. And so again, this was published in a last week. Actually, there's not, the proofs are not even out yet. Um, but basically, it's exactly the same effect as with the tumors, but using immunosuppressive cells. And it's a different chemokine. This is actually quite an interesting point, because even though CCL2 is really expressed by plaques, um, it's not differentially expressed because it's diffused. So the, the, the best chemokine in this case was fractalkine. And therefore, we added fractalkine receptor. Um, into Tregs, and they were able to get to the plaque and, 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 and block um, or reduce at least the impact of, of plaque formation. And this was done with a group of Danilo Norata, who studies atherosclerosis in the University of Milan, and Fabrizia Bonaccina. And um, I think with this, I'm done. I have to thank the members of my lab. So Marco Cremonesi, Cecilia Bonfiglio, Elisa Martini, who uh, did most of the work actually on the heart, um, and Erika Valamatti, and Gianluigi Condorelli's. Uh, lab who are our amazing cardiovascular uh, collaborators. And with this, I'll take questions from you and the people online. Thank you.